So now let's really get into the form. The second keynote speaker is the chair of OECD Space Forum, Claire Jolly. She will present us her insight on space economy prospects for the o from the OECD. Unfortunately, she can't be here with us in person, but she will deliver her lecture online. Welcome to KSF. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me. And, and I, I'm sorry that I cannot join you today uh, for this event on, on, on site. Um, I really hope to be able to travel back to Korea very soon. And I really thank you for inviting the OECD to provide some prospects on the space economy. So you have the best greetings from Paris. And I will provide here, um, I would say, some context for some of the discussions that will take place over the next few uh, hours. Maybe to start with just uh, a hint of the OECD work on space. We have been working on the space economy for more than 15 years now. Um, there are a number of data, uh, statistics obviously that are coming out of the OECD, but we are really supported here by a steering group composed of agencies and ministries, including Korea. Uh, allowing us not only to provide some, uh, I would say, OECD statistics, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes, but also to make sure that we are taking a close look at the developments in the space economy. We just released two major publications that may be of interest. One is the OECD Handbook on Measuring the Space Economy. I'll come back to that. We believe indicators are crucial. And we also released another major report called Earth's Orbit at Risk with the Economics of Space Sustainability. We have a large project that is ongoing right now with more than 24 universities, including from Korea, on trying to get a grasp of the importance of space sustainability and putting some numbers to actually sustain different policy options. This, this keynote will really be looking at two different topics. The first one is that the transform transformation of the space sector itself is continuing. The second one will be to look ahead as the global economy is facing some significant challenges. The OECD just released a few days ago uh, with the Secretary General and the OECD Chief Economist the latest um, data on, this, on the general economy. I will share some of that today. So first, the transformation of the space sector is really accelerating. Uh, I think this is a very good proof today with the number of actors that you have in this particular forum, is that the number of countries operating in space keeps growing. We have more than 90 countries almost with a registered satellite in orbit today, with an acceleration since the, since the late 1990s. Many newcomers are looking at developing specific technologies, but also at entering uh, global value chains. This is something that is supported by indicators and bibliometrics, where we see indeed that the knowledge about space applications in particular is going in different places around the world, but also in terms of patents for space-related technologies, where more actors are getting involved. In this context, space budgets are at the highest since the Apollo era, I would say. Um, still, space represents a, a tiny, a very small share of GDP in most countries around the world. But what's interesting is the number of countries that are investing in space. We are seeing indeed these budgets rise, and this is no surprise. Uh, obviously, some of the key actors remain at the top, but the spread, I would say, of expertise is really growing. And obviously, commercial space is playing a key role, especially for the past, I would say, eight years or so, a number of countries, particularly the United States, have actually been pushing for quite a number of commercialization policies. This is a topic that will probably come back again and again, how to work better with the private sector. But what we've been seeing over the past few months uh, is this 
incredible role of commercial space during a major conflict. This slide that I'm showing here was actually shared with the OECD Council, which is the group of 38 countries that are forming, um, I would say, well, the Council of the OECD, uh, as we briefed ambassadors and ministers about the role of space to actually monitor the situation. And so far, we never have seen so many different actors providing data, providing signals to actually uh, support uh, the management, I would say, of the consequences of the war in Ukraine. Uh, we know that the U.S. Department of Defense, which is following closely the crisis, is using data for more than 100 companies these days. Also, the, the case of using commercial space assets to support the population uh, is quite important, particularly in terms of satellite broadband, with the example of SpaceX. Uh, but not only, there are a number of satellite operators that have been providing um, data streams, I would say, in order to help uh, the country, uh, country's population. This is just one example, but that means indeed that, that commercial space is starting to really play a key role for many different domains. And I know quite a few will be discussed again, uh, probably tomorrow during one of the sessions. So we're seeing this acceleration of commercial applications from space, but also in parallel of space debris. We have seen almost a quadruple number of satellites in, in low Earth orbit since 2019. So that means indeed there's a lot, a lot of satellites out there, but in parallel, space debris accidents have been increasing. We are studying these topics within the OECD, with space agencies and the private sector and academia, uh, because we believe this is one of the major challenges to come for the space economy. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not the day after tomorrow, but this is going to be a crucial, crucial limitation um, for a number of activities if we don't act, if policymakers don't act. So we are really looking at this issue of the economics of space sustainability to build up new options for policymakers and the private sector so we can actually prepare for the difficulties to come. Because looking ahead, there are quite, I would say, a number of issues that are coming up. Um, what we've seen during the pandemic, and that was a bit of a surprise to many analysts, was that the OECD economies in particular continued to increase investment in research and development, even during the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic. It was the first time on record in 2020 in which a global recession did not translate into a drop in R&D expenditure. But obviously, the situation has now changed as the world is coping with a massive energy price shock. And these are some of the topics that here that I want to mention as you look ahead for the space economy prospects. In terms of the general R&D investment, we have a number of indicators that help us track investment in different major domains. Uh, you will see here the top line is on the health. We are following this uh, closely at the OECD. There was a big, I would say, hike in uh, health R&D, uh, mainly because of vaccines that, are, that showed here in 2020. And that was the case for most R&D sectors. Even for space, we saw indeed a hike in 2020. The uses of applications were actually growing very sharply. We are seeing this going down again in 2021, and we are putting together some numbers for 2022. So at this point, you can say that indeed, um, space has been sort of immune to this major crisis that we've seen over the past couple of years. However, things are changing because of inflation in particular. Inflation, as you probably all know, as you do shopping, is record high for 2022 in many places around the world. And it's broad-based. It's not only when you try to buy fuel in many countries. These are some of the recent numbers that were published by the OECD just a few days ago in terms of the projected inflation in percentage. We see that the pressures have intensified, largely due to the war in Ukraine, which has pushed up 
energy and food commodity prices. And of course, this helped trigger increasing prices across a broad basket of goods and services. This means that not only citizens were affected, but also, of course, industries in many different sectors. And again, the space industry is not immune as supply chains have tightened as a number of products, raw materials are getting really, really expensive. This is something that we need to, to remember as we look ahead at the future of the space economy. What the OECD um, projects is that this inflation will actually decelerate um, simply because of also the decelerating growth that we are expecting over the next couple of years. Because we believe that the world may be facing an extended period of subdued global economic growth. Here are some um, uh, GDP uh, evolutions as seen by the OECD in percentage. And we are seeing a number of countries that are obviously winners and some that are more losers in the current situation. Saudi Arabia, for instance, is a clear winner because of the energy uh, production that it provides. But obviously, there are you know, best cases and worst cases in, in, in here. Uh, in this particular aspect, we believe that North America, the US in particular, and, Euro and Europe are slowing sharply today, but definitely uh, the threats in general for the world economy are growing. There are issues concerning global food security, especially if this is combined with extreme weather. This summer in particular has been quite historic again for many parts of the world. And we are seeing some floods, obviously, in Australia. We are seeing um, major heat waves that actually uh, touched many parts of the world from Asia, Europe, the US. All this had major impacts, again, not only on citizens, but also on infrastructure and supply chains for a number of actors. There were even some delays um, in actually uh, getting some launches we are seeing indeed increasing risks to come over the next couple of years. Again, something to remember. This may be turned into some opportunities as we will need even more monitoring of situations. But again, something to keep in mind. So here I listed some of the key uncertainties that we have uh, for the space R&D and innovation systems, many of which we will talk about over the next few days. In terms, first, of the long-term investments, I think it's a clear message that I started with. Governments uh, and private actors have been investing heavily in space. And we do believe that these long-term investments will continue for the foreseeable future. However, what we are already seeing, at least in a few countries, is that for public research organizations, such as space agency, there's an issue of maybe limiting the scope in some key programs, revisiting maybe even some of the commercial models. Are we going towards further commercialization, outsourcing? This is an option on the table for some of the agencies that we talked about. In terms of the private sector and the investors, and I know there will be a presentation about some of the uh, private investments in space, we believe that um, entrepreneurs are actually preparing their response, I would say, to ongoing uncertainty. We are going to go through a new phase beyond the hype that we have seen over the past five years. This is something that we have seen already in the stock markets in North America, but we believe that indeed we're going to need some more resilient economic models with, again, commercial investments, obviously, but also the importance of anchor contracts from governments to support innovation. We are seeing competing models of resilience across OECD countries. There's this issue of open innovation versus technological autonomy. You need to actually have some sovereign technologies, I would say, but you also need to buy out a number of technologies you don't have. And these all issues of trying to actually get back some of the supply chains uh, in uh, countries themselves. We are seeing this in Europe with this need to actually uh, restore or create new 
supply chains for raw materials in particular. This is something that's going to be crucial as we look ahead for the next 10 years. Where are the raw materials going to come from? So these are some of the key uncertainties. These are some of the key challenges that we are seeing for the space economy. It's looking still bright, but with major challenges to overcome. Again, the funding levels, the modes of funding for space should remain more or less the same for the next couple of years. However, there are changes on the horizon, opportunities, but also major challenges. And I'll leave you with just one last slide in terms of how do you actually track better than some of these socioeconomic fundamentals. And here it's a bit of a marketing blurb, uh, but this report is available online. It's, it's one of the key OECD handbooks uh, that is out today. Uh, it's, it's this OECD handbook on measuring the space economy, our second edition, and it was actually done with a lot of support from the space community, particularly the Space Forum members, Korea in particular, actors were very keen on, on supporting this effort, but it provides some useful guidelines, I would say, to encourage, facilitate data collection on the space economy among both, I would say, the historic actors, but also the new space actors. So in this particular report that, again, you can just download, there are many indicators, some of which that I actually presented during this uh, talk. Um, and we at the OECD are looking forward to putting together our new indicators next year as we look ahead at the evolutions of the space economy. So I thank again very much the organizers for allowing me to share some of these findings from the OECD. And I wish you a very, very good conference to come. Thank you again. 네, 수고해 주신 의장님께 큰 박수 보내 주시기 바랍니다. Please give her a big round of applause. So now we will begin session one with the topic challenges of each country in response to the global space economy. We will hear the presentations of six speakers. So first, we have here with us offline a Mark Cirrus from Luxembourg LSA who will give a presentation on Small on Earth and Big in Space, Luxembourg's strategy to maximize its footprint in the space field. So please give him a big hand as we welcome him up to the stage. So good afternoon um, and thank you very much to the organizers to give me this opportunity to share some information about Luxembourg here during this forum. I'm very happy to be here uh, in person. I have had the honor to participate in the past already, uh, but you know, considering that we, we are here also with a delegation of Luxembourg of companies and research centers, it's of course a pleasure to, to present live uh, these elements. So the story of Luxembourg started already uh, quite a long time ago, and we talk here about uh, the 80s, when the government uh, created the first commercial satellite operator uh, in Europe. And that was um, some interesting period coming from, uh, you know, the legacy of institutionally driven activities. And for us, that was the first commercialization wave of space in the 80s. A few other milestones in our history are the moment when Luxembourg became a member state of the European Space Agency, uh, when we started our Space Resources.lu initiative, and we, I will come back on that later, when our space agency has been created in 2018, and more recently with our very last version of our national space strategy. Important to note that space is very high on the agenda, uh, on the political agenda in Luxembourg. We have a few priority uh, sectors that are developed and uh, the Ministry of the Economy has defined here, uh, you, know, you know them here or you see them on the slide, space is one of them. So space is in Luxembourg one of the priority sectors 
uh, meant to diversify our economy. We have been, uh, in a certain sense, we had the chance also to have a very long-term commitment from the government. So as you have seen, starting in, in the 80s, this has been a continuous effort, strongly supported by the government, to develop this sector in Luxembourg. Um, we have had a very uh, a vision, you guys can say, that was strongly driven also by the economic objectives. Uh, as, you, as you see here, the, the, the final goal is really to create a, a sustainable economic activity in Luxembourg in the space domain. So, our strategy, very strong, diversify national economy. I think this is the first goal. Uh, when we support activities in the country, it's less for the scientific interest of it, but much more for the economic interest of it. Uh, that does not mean that you don't need the capabilities to do it. So, of course, we support research and education as well in this domain. But this is very important to also expand the space capabilities to support this uh, economic growth. Competitiveness is key, especially for a small country like Luxembourg, where we have basically no significant domestic market. Our companies have directly to compete internationally in, on the European level or, or even beyond. International cooperation is also a very important element. Uh, a lot of things, of course, are done in competition, especially when com companies are involved and you have a commercial market. Of course, you have to, be, to, to do this competition and it, it's also good to be competitive. On the other hand, many other endeavors need cooperation. And this is also the reason why we are here uh, for a few days here in Korea. And last but not least, we have built up a certain leadership over the years in the domain of satellite communications, and this is definitely a position that we will continue to defend in the future. So our strategy is strongly driven by a key word, sustainability. And I think here uh, the the presentation of Claire Jolie from OECD was also very clear on that. There is a real strong evolution. We are in a new momentum in the space domain with increasing debris, with increasing operational satellites, with increasing use of uh, means and data from space. And that means we have also to look into the development of this sector in a sustainable way. And so we have here put at, uh, sustainability at heart of our uh, of our s strategy. First of all, we want to have a sustainable economic development. So it's really to have companies in the country that will deliver on the long term, will create jobs, will create new c capabilities, will support as well, uh, you know, education and, and research as well. Second aspect is sustainability on Earth. I mean, there have been many examples already where space data or space infrastructure have supported uh, this sustainability on Earth. And I think here, uh, again, uh, when, when you have seen the, the, the slide on uh, the Ukraine war, uh, you have seen as well that these data are used to better anticipate harvest, for example, which, which is also something extremely important uh, to support uh, sustainable development goals, for example, of, of the United Nations. The third element is sustainability in space. And creating these debris, having more activities in space, will require also, let's say, a, a way that we can continue using space in a way that it's not, you know, creating more difficulties or even hampering certain developments, and especially also commercial developments. And last but not least, um, sustainability of use of space resources. I will come back on space resources later. So this gives you also a little bit uh, how our budget is uh, split up over the next five years. Um, again, you see how important using space, creating new applications, and also valorizing all these capabilities through commercial activities is really, again, uh, the highest focus uh, of the implementation of our policy. 
So the space agency has been created in 2018 and has immediately get also the mission to implement this strategy and, and these objectives. And so you can see that we have then structured that in four main pillars, economic growth. So we are there to support our companies to develop their business, to create this growth of revenues, to create the jobs in the country. More generally, we are there to support uh, the expansion of the space ecosystem. And that means that we are looking at it from different perspectives. Uh, for example, we have worked on uh, setting up uh, a new law uh, for authorizing and supervising the space activities in Luxembourg, and, and this law entered into force in 2021. We have a specific law as well on space resources. We are also supporting the companies in their technological developments. So we, we have funding to help them taking the risks and, and bringing new products and new services on the market. We help them as well to access private equity funding. This is also a very important uh, element when you develop commercial activities. Of course, having good new technologies is one aspect, but you also need the funding to scale up your company and really to develop these commercial activities. So we are also very active in creating the link between the investment community and our space companies. <laughs> Well, talent development is the third pillar of, of our missions. This is crucial. Uh, when you have a, a sector like that that is growing or need to grow, you, of course, need to have the right people with the right skills uh, and, and make them av available to, to the community. And so this is a, a big challenge. I'm sure uh, this is a challenge that a lot of companies are are encountering and here again we are trying here to help our companies uh, to find these uh, these people so we have programs with the university where they have uh, well our university in Luxembourg has now two master programs um, <clears throat> to educate uh, the, the people uh, we also have some other uh, initiatives that really create awareness or even give the opportunity to have a first job in a space agency Last but not least, as I mentioned already before, um, the international engagement is extremely important, so LSA is also very active in creating partnerships or supporting partnerships between ecosystems around the world. Spaceresources.lu, I had to say a word about that because this is really our sort of long-term visionary element uh, of our space strategy, where even though we believe that there is still a lot of work to do today really to be able to exploit resources in space, this will be a game changer in the future for economic development of space activities. And so it's time now to start working on that. And when we talk about space resources here, you see a few examples. So all types of materials that you can find in space on various uh, ob uh, celestial objects. And you see that we have already identified a number of applications where these resources will really create an added value. And of course, life support to astronauts and with the current trend uh, to increase these type of activities for the future, with a number of visions where we see more permanent activities in space and on the moon, for example, this will be a crucial element to be able to use resources uh, to develop these activities. Propellant construction uh, is also, uh, let's say, interesting here. Uh, radiation shielding, and you can find many other uh, applications as well uh, that will use these resources. So a few um, sources possible where you can find these resources. Of course, um, uh, the moon is one, other planets, even moons of these planets, asteroids being near-Earth asteroids or asteroids from, from the asteroid belt, and even here you see uh, satellites themselves. So the day we will be able to recycle all these elements, they will become also valuable resources to develop uh, or to implement new applications. So you see here also for space resources, we have defined a very clear vision on what we need to do to achieve this goal. And so first of all, it's enabling space resources. 
So the people who are following a little bit this, this topic know that there are a lot of debates also worldwide about the regulatory framework that is required. You need to create more awareness about that at government level. You need to create more you know, engagement also to finance and, and to bring all this forward. Research, education, of course, is an extremely important element. Even though we see this long-term perspective, there is a lot to do. There is a lot to discover and to learn and to develop uh, to, to reach this goal as well. And last but not least, of course, the commercial aspect of it. At the end, we would like also that this develops a new economy, a new, a new economy in space. So we have been able over the last years through this policy to really expand our ecosystem and uh, we, we have uh, the so-called space directory that is listing all the uh, public and private entities that are active in space in Luxembourg. We have put here a number of logos and, and a few of these companies uh, and research centers are also present here today and tomorrow. So I would uh, definitely encourage you being present here to meet with them and try to know more about the activities we are doing in Luxembourg and potentially then also, uh, who knows, create new partnerships between our two countries. I wanted also to end here with showing a few of the results uh, in terms of uh, companies that have developed in Luxembourg. Uh, you can see that we have uh, even a little bit more than tripled the size of our ecosystem over the last, I would say, a bit less than 10 years. That means that uh, I think we, uh, we were very engaged in developing this sector in Luxembourg and uh, we will continue doing so. And here you can see that uh, we are already uh, seeing some fruits of the investment that we have put into this sector over the last years. So thank you very much for your attention. Very much, Mr. Saras, for your insightful message. Now, I'd like to invite Mr. Alexander McDonald, the chief economist of NASA, to talk about the cooperation in space between Korea and the U.S. We will show you the video that he has sent to us ahead of time. It is my honor to have the opportunity to address you during this important convening on the topic of the global space economy in the context of space cooperation between the United States and the Republic of Korea. Before I begin, however, I would like to take a moment to offer my condolences to the families whose loved ones were lost to the tragedy that occurred in Taiwan on Halloween. Please know that you have been in the thoughts of all of us who work at NASA. International collaboration has been a cornerstone of NASA activities throughout our history. And today, NASA has over 600 international agreements with 130 nations. The United States and the Republic of Korea have an overarching civil space framework agreement that enables bilateral collaboration and the coordination of project-specific cooperation. In all, NASA and the Republic of Korea have cooperated across all of NASA's mission areas including exploration, science, and aeronautics research dating as far back as 1962. Today, NASA's partnership with South Korea continues to span all of these areas, and we are proud to partner with South Korea as it increases focus on expanding civil space capabilities as part of the growing global space economy. Today, the global space economy is larger than ever before. The size of the global space economy was recently estimated to be around $469 billion. And we are also seeing record levels of space investment in space startups, with an estimated $15 billion invested in space startups last year alone. Truly, we are in the midst of a second space age, and there are new, unprecedented opportunities awaiting the people, companies, and nations that are able to seize this exciting new moment in space development. Part of the excitement of this moment is due to the growing international movement to return to the moon, this time to stay, with NASA's Artemis campaign 
leading the way. We were very pleased that South Korea, an important partner for NASA and space, became the 10th signatory of the Artemis Accords in May 2021. South Korea's decision to join the still growing community of nations committed to exploring space peacefully, safely, and transparently demonstrates leadership in the global space community. The goal of Artemis is not only to land the first woman and first person of color on the moon, but to establish a permanent human presence there. With NASA's Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft, as well as the other human infrastructure, such as the human landing system, we will test technologies and exploration practices to reduce risks and overcome the challenges of long-term human exploration of the Moon and Mars. These capabilities will enable robust operations on the lunar surface, while also serving as a testbed for a future historic first human mission to Mars. Our combined international and industry efforts on the surface and around the Moon will help us develop a foundation for deep space exploration that will support a new era of sustainable lunar exploration by commercial and international partners. With these types of ambitions common to humans everywhere, international cooperation on Artemis is intended not only to bolster space exploration, but to enhance peaceful relationships among nations. NASA is happy to see the interest that Korean organizations have in expanding space exploration, which is reflected in the number of organizations with which we regularly work, including the Korea Aerospace Research Institute, CARI, and the Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute, CASI, both of which we are actively engaged in ongoing collaborative projects with NASA. We celebrated the exciting success of Korea's first Artemis contribution earlier this year in August with the launch of the Korean Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter, KPLO, which carried the NASA Shadow Cam instrument. Not only was this another successful collaboration between NASA scientists and their CARI counterparts, but the data that will be returned will be useful in planning for future Artemis missions. We expect this first contribution to the Artemis program will be followed by many more. For example, NASA and CARI are currently discussing possible cooperation on the Korea Deep Space Antenna and its potential use for future Artemis missions. In addition, NASA and CASI are discussing several CASI instruments to be delivered to the lunar surface on a future NASA commercial lunar payload services delivery, the first of which will be the Lunar Space Environment Monitor expected to be delivered to the lunar surface in 2024. Our cooperation does not start and end with Artemis, however, as the scope of collaboration between NASA and Korean space organizations extends past exploration and space science research. NASA and CASI also collaborate in heliophysics and space weather research. Heliophysics collaboration includes the Coronal Diagnostic Experiment, an instrument that will be installed on the International Space Station, and most recently, the small-scale magnetospheric and ionospheric plasma experiment, a Korean CubeSat that will study space weather. A great example of successful collaboration in Earth science is the Korea-US Air Quality Field Campaign, Chorus AQ, which involves integrated aircraft, ground site, and satellite observations to understand the factors controlling air quality across urban, rural, and coastal environments. Driven by the success of the Chorus AQ field campaign, NASA and the Korean National Institute of Environmental Research are currently working together for follow-on studies in the region and across Southeast Asia. Finally, in aeronautics research, NASA and CARI recently signed an agreement for collaboration on advanced air mobility which will allow for both agencies to test the readiness of vehicles and airspace systems in urban environments. As the first international partner to cooperate with NASA on its advanced air mobility campaign, CARI will help with furthering standards in this potentially important emerging field. This is just a sampling of NASA's current collaboration with South Korea, and I know that we have other exciting projects in the works. NASA was pleased to see the inclusion of civil space in the joint statement released by President Biden and President Yoon earlier this year and look forward to seeing how our partnership in civil space exploration will continue to expand. We were particularly pleased to hear of President Yoon's goal to make Korea a space power, as we know this will mean a greater focus on developing both the civil space industry and space-related education programs in Korea, which will benefit not only the space community in Korea, but the international space community as well. As we forge ahead into the future of space exploration, international cooperation both bilateral cooperation 
and multilateral cooperation through organizations such as the United Nations will be integral to our collective success. Finally, I would like to end on a personal note. It has been many years since I visited South Korea for the International Astronautical Congress in Daejeon in 2009, but I have very fond memories of my time there. After attending the conference and visiting satellite production facilities in Daejeon, I traveled around the country, eventually making my way to Busan, and making sure to stop at the ancient astronomical observatory of Chungsung Dae in Gyeongju. It was clear to me that a love of space exploration and astronomy is a passion within Korean culture, as demonstrated by the growing role that Korean filmmakers and musicians are having on our global space culture. In addition to my appreciation for the technical work and collaborations I have mentioned, I would also like to send my congratulations to the filmmakers behind Space Sweepers and The Silent Sea, which I have enjoyed very much. And I would also like to pass on my appreciation to global phenomenon BTS for their wonderful recent collaboration with Coldplay on the song My Universe, which demonstrated beautifully how both music and a love of the stars are truly global languages. So to my space friends over in South Korea, I wish to say thank you. Thank you for your enduring national partnership with NASA. Thank you for your cultural commitment to peaceful, science-led space exploration and the spirit of entrepreneurship that is helping to shape the space industry globally. Be well, and Godspeed on your journeys. Thank you very much, Alexander McDonald. As a citizen of Korea, I feel like we have the DNA to become a space powerhouse. Next, we will welcome Kyoto Tateki from JAXA. She will give us a talk on the topic JAXA activities for space industry enhancement online. Please give her a big round of applause. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's a great honor to be given the opportunity to explain JAXA's activity today at the Korea Space Forum. I'm Kyoko Datiki, Director of JAXA, New Business Development and Industrial Relations Department. So last decade, the landscape of space activities in Japan has also been facing the big changes. The majority of space activity is still led by the government, which private uh, industries acting as a supplier or contractor for public pub projects and relying nothing on the public funding. But the commercially driven ecosystem has emer emerged with their innovative business models in Japan. So as a public R&D research and development organization, JAXA seeks not to only accomplish not on our project, but also foster and enhance space industry, leveraging governmental or our own activity. So as the title of the slide says today, I would like to introduce our challenges to enhance space industry, which drives the global space economy. So first of all, I will explain the overview of our organization. JAXA was established in 2003 by emerging three organizations known as NASDA, IJAS, and NAL. The budget of fiscal year 2022 is now 223 billion yen, roughly 2,000 million dollars per year. And the number of staff is around 1,500. Uh, so it seems to be small uh, on a scale, but we are doing various projects with great support of Japanese private companies and international partners. So next, the circle shows JAXA's role in Japan's space activities. JAXA is positioned as a core implementing agency supporting the government and managing 40 to 50 projects, including a participation in the International Space Station program and the Artemis program. In addition to the traditional R&D of the launcher system or satellite or the aerospace technology, 
mission for socio-economical or global challenges such as disaster monitoring, security, environment and climate changes are involved and make a great importance. Needless to say, international cooperation is indispensable for the space development and now the space economy would be considered in the global point of view. We have promoted our R&D activities mainly in these five domains and are uh, proud to have shared many achievements. Japanese space transportation system, we developed H2A and H2B, which keeps high reliability with an excellent success rate, more than 97%. And we are now waiting for the first test flight of H3 launch under development. The JAXA satellite technology has a wide range, including Earth observation, telecommunication, positioning, and as well as technology demonstration. So they are contributing to the sustainable development goals. And on the side, JAXA manned space activity through the ISS International Space Station program sent 11 astronauts already. And I'd like to add to say that Japanese experimental module Kibo has also been promoted for the commercial use for the more than 10 years. And it has more commercial in the field of protein crystals experiment or the satellite development opportunities and the use of exposed facilities as well. The so space science and exploration activity produced outstanding results. I hope you have heard of the return of Hayabusa 2 capsule and its contribution to the academia. So last but not least, the advanced air aviation research activity contributes to the aviation industry, which is its vision to add sustainable aviation integrated society. So they, they are our main activities and so I would like to tell about more economy aspect by JAXA. So this chart is an overview of the governmental strategic measures for space industry fostering uh, starting 2018. Uh, the measures target not only space startups, so-called the new space in Japan as well, but also new comers to the space business. These measures are taken along with the company's growth. So starting from the networking opportunities, business ideas, contests, or prizes. Following by the more supportive programs for the business and the technical maturity. On the slides, I also put the JAXA's major initiatives corresponding to the government's measures on the upper side. So since JAXA is an R&D organization, its role is more technical aspects, but in a certain extent, JAXA is trying to contribute to more business side for the purpose of bringing more effectivity to the space economy. They are essential activities by the business and the industrial relations department of JAXA. So JSPAC, is a co-creation R&D program in which JAXA is responsible for R&D, the technical aspect, and the private company aims to create new business by utilizing the R&D result. I'll tell you later in the detail. And small SAT mission expansion program is brand new and developed by the Industry Academia Collaboration, aiming to create innovative CubeSat missions we will also plan to utilize private transportation services to promote our space industry. And the Constellation Co-Creation Program is, has also just started this year, which is to contribute to the co coordination between small and large, so traditional size to big satellites. And JAXA Venture or JAXA Startups are the SMEs who uses JAXA's open intellectual property or technology for its business. So we are supporting these JAXA uh, ventures. Investment or equity financing function uh, starting last year and hopefully we can close our first deal in the near future. So it's a quite new also, new function for us. 
When incubation program is being coordinated with the Japanese government, the cabinet office called uh, S Booster, we will have a last selection the next month. Okay. And we have more activities of the space industry promotion. So in order to enhance the industry promotion, JAXA has a strong cooperation with private companies. We have the launcher system and they are planned to, to be provided as launch service by the operation of the private company itself after the accomplishment of the R&D. So they can start the launch service after the development. And second, I want to highlight two items. So the dual utilization is one of the key factors to promote the industrial collaboration. So JAXA Innovation Hub Center, it's the name of the uh, place, the center organization, is aiming to R&D used in the space and on the earth at the, in the both sites. So it is quite difficult to pursue only for the space utilization, but at the same time, the technology should be used in, on earth with the more and more added value. And one more thing, the on-orbit demonstration is also indispensable for space activity. JAXA's innovative demonstration satellite program and the Kibo small sat deployment system reached totally 85 satellite development de deployment, excuse me, and they are all used by the, the private company or academia or international organizations. They are also our promote industry promotion program. So we also support incubation program like this. So including such technology, transportation satellite program using small satellites or innovative future space transportation system technology, r and So we have many programs. And I want to highlight, yeah, let me introduce our unique program called JSPARC. Japan, JAXA Space Innovation Through Partnership and Co-Creation. This program started in 2018 along with the government's policy, as I showed in the last slide, to enhance the Japanese space industry. Compared with the previous Japanese pro JAXA project or program, this co-creation partnership has a unique, unprecedented character due to its non-funding but double targeting activity. In this program, JAXA and the partner company, private company, who are seeking the space business, jointly create a feasible business plan during the concept planning or study phase. Then the private company and JAXA proceeded to demonstration phase to really demonstrate their business. So through this process, JAXA and the private company maximize JAXA's technology's heritage and develop the planned space business in a short, speedy cycle. JAXA JSPAC aims to create and expand space-related business as well as space technology innovation. That's why I told you this is the double target activity. So currently, we have been uh, doing uh, 36 co-creation activities or has been started under the state park program. Each project range from space business with cutting edge technology, such as space transportation and space debris removal, to the business which is familiar to daily life, such as education and, and entertainment. We think partnering with those commercial capability are one of the key aspects for making space industry sustainable. And now JAXA's collaboration is getting broadened to more human life sites. We have now two platforms for a community activity to gather the industrial interests. Space Photosphere has more than uh, 50 organizations joining. And the Think Space Life is, is uh, challenging to enhance the space life 
comfortability in the aspect of healthcare and jurisdiction has already welcomed more than 100 companies. So it is also our activity to support the Japanese company or industry to present the exhibitions held overseas where companies can show their strengths and get business opportunities. We plan to exhibit at the well-known international symposium and the conferences, as well as organizing our own events to promote the cooperation in the global economy. Finally, here are some references. JAXA is also supporting companies' cooperation or market creation or launching their business to do, uh, at the market on the web by promoting IoT or web-based information as well. We have a potential folder site for company information, and we also use the JIGTEC site, which is operated by the Japanese government affiliated organization. They are for the matching business matching for the space business, not only space business, but also other global economy. But anyway, so the company can find the chance to penetrate their market. So th these are our promotion activity. So that's all for my presentation. JAXA is an R&D organization, and at the same time, we try to maximize our knowledge and technology to promote the space economy. So thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the insightful presentation. Earlier in the opening ceremony, our President Yoon said that we will be establishing a KASA. So I believe that this presentation had more meaning to us. We will have a short break of 20 minutes and come back after the break. It says 540, so please have a break until then. And in case we start earlier, I will let you know. Sorry about that. We will have a 20 minute break. And when I let you know, we will resume the conference at 520. Thank you. We will see you after the break. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed your break. We will resume the forum. Now we will invite the head of education, education office from ESA regarding the workforce development policy and programs of ESA. Let's invite him online. Please welcome him with a round of applause. Okay, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me ask for a small confirmation from Young Won if my audio is okay. Yes, your audio is very fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, hosting uh, me to the organizers for hosting the conference and for uh, having invited us uh, from ESA. Uh, I will try to put my presentation in full screen mode. I believe you uh, you should see it now. Um, so I am uh, Joost van Russel. I am the head of the ESA Academy at the European Space Agency, uh, where we work with our ESA education program uh, to help preparing the next generation of space scientists, space engineers, uh, space entrepreneurs, uh, and so on. Um, so I would like to give you a short introduction into our education program and how it contributes to uh, the next generation uh, space workforce for Europe. Uh, so as said, our program is contributing to building the human capital that the European space sector needs to implement uh, an evolving uh, space program. And we do that working on two main fronts. Uh, on the one hand, we use space as a learning and teaching context for primary schools and secondary schools. And on the other hand, we offer hands-on opportunities 
uh, training, workshops and access to uh, test fa facilities, uh, laboratories, so state-of-the-art facilities within ESA to university level students. And here we aim to share the expertise that ESA can offer. So we try to use the, let's say, the fascination, the, the body of knowledge generated by uh, European uh, space program uh, for the benefit of the, of the young generation, uh, to inspire them, to engage them, uh, to help develop their competences and skills, and later on to prepare them for a career in the space sector. Um, in this sense, uh, our education program plays a fundamental role, uh, role in uh, the growth of Europe and has uh, recently gained a good political support for the, uh, for the education program at, uh, at ESA. Um, so as said, we are organized across two pillars. The STEM program targets primary and secondary uh, children, so children from three to typically roughly 18 years old. And the ESA Academy targets university level students. On the STEM program, the focus is on using space as a context. So for example, here you see uh, Thomas Pesquet, one of our European astronauts on board the International Space Station. Um, and he is uh, handling uh, AstroPi uh, devices that have been programmed by thousands of school children. So thousands of school children have developed a small code and the winners are uploaded to the International Space Station and they see their experiment running from the space station. So space here is a context. The children are not learning about space as such, but they are learning to code. So they are developing a subset of IT skills and, in, and being inspired to engage into STEM uh, education. Another example is uh, how we use uh, space as a context to teach teachers, educators, how they can make use of space in the classroom. So the European Space Agency has a network called ESEROS, European Space Education Research Offices, and they are uh, available in uh, almost all of our 22 member states to ESA. And these offices are national bodies co-funded by ESA and the government to provide uh, space-related training or space context training in classrooms. And we offer workshops for educators and teachers where they can make use of our facilities and equipment uh, to bring back space to the classroom. So that is for the primary and secondary uh, level. Uh, myself, I am responsible for ESA Academy. ESA Academy targets university level students. On the one hand, with training, where we offer typically one week or two week intensive training courses to students uh, that can apply and be selected uh, to follow this in addition to their university uh, studies. So our objective is always to complement what acad academia in Europe are doing providing additional training in uh, topics of, in which ESA has a certain level of expertise. We offer training on the one hand in a classroom type setting. The room you see on the picture is also designed as a concurrent design facility. So we do concurrent engineering studies here with our students. And we also offer projects, projects in which students will be involved from end to end into a space related project guided by specialists from ESA um, with access to our facilities and always aiming for this transfer of knowledge from professional experienced professionals to university students. So you see here on pictures our laboratory. We also work with sounding rockets and then we have experiments that we fly to the ISS. And we have about 10 other programs that are not depicted here uh, using drop towers, parabolic flights, centrifuges, uh, CubeSats uh, and so on. Um, so that was the program today. Now we are also evolving. We have just presented to our council at ministerial level the program Space for Education 2030. 
this is our future education program, building on the current one, but evolving uh, in terms of impact, in terms of reach, in terms of topics that are addressed. We are aiming for uh, quite an important evolution. So Space for Education 2030 is our title for the long-term vision for the program. Uh, it is building on ESA's Agenda 2025, and it aims at strengthening the program's positioning at the forefront of innovation in education. So this program proposal is building on a resolution that was voted at the Council at ministerial level in 2019. It contributes to ESA's Agenda 2025, which is the overall agenda defined by the ESA Director General. Uh, it meets the recommendations from what we call the High Level Advisory Group, uh, which is an advisory group to the ESA DG that has uh, identified education as a key enabler for the space program in the future. Um, so we have went through um, um, a consultation phase with industry in Europe, with all the directorates of the European Space Agency and with all our member states. And through the consultation, we have identified what are the main needs for the European Space Programme in terms of skills, in terms of competences. Where are the gaps? What is uh, the challenges that industry faces when trying to attract new talent? Where are uh, the domains in which uh, students need to be further trained? And what are the new topics, not yet covered by many academia or by our program, that we should address in the future? And based on this consultation and the identification of the gaps and the needs, we have designed a new education program that is addressing uh, all these. Uh, and this is how our future program uh, is, uh, is looking. So on the left, you see we have a pillar STEM learning and inspiration. The inspiration element is getting uh, a higher attention, mainly uh, towards the objective of uh, engaging students, engaging in particular also girls, young children into STEM, into science, technology, engineering, and, uh, and mathematics. Um, so I will not go through all, all the details here, uh, but as you see, we have an evolving program. Uh, it will address new topics. Uh, it aims to reach uh, a higher number of children and students in Europe. And uh, there is a strong element of e-learning also embedded into this. Following the pandemic, uh, we have engaged into uh, online uh, learning and we are developing a platform to uh, make use of e-learning in uh, almost all our uh, future programs. Um, then to uh, conclude, I would like to make use of the remaining time uh, to show you uh, a short video uh, that explains better than, uh, than I can uh, what Space for Education 2030 targets to do. Um, Young Won, could you confirm that the, the audio, please? The world is changing place? at the speed of light. Technology is everywhere, and new businesses and jobs are emerging in response. But with change come challenges to every aspect of our lives. Challenges you have that ask a lot of younger generations in particular. They will be the ones to overcome these global challenges by advancing science, innovating technologies, reimagining economies, and inventing sustainable businesses. But they need the skills for the job because they can't do it alone. Space for Education 2030 is investing in youth for the future by imagining the possibilities and getting them ready for the eventualities. Space for Education 2030 brings space to the minds of students of all ages, so that the youngest may explore STEM without fear to broaden their horizons, and the oldest may take their future careers to new heights. We empower educators so that they may innovate their teaching practices. Space for Education 2030 puts space in young people's hands, because nothing is more powerful than learning by doing. 
hands-on and interdisciplinary projects challenge young minds to get what they need in the twenty first century critical thinking communication and resilience but also creativity and entrepreneurship space for education twenty thirty makes space for collaboration through teamwork guidance and know-how from leading professionals we create the space to engage youth with the exciting careers waiting to be chosen Space for Education 2030 is no privilege of the few, but the purview of many. Learners, educators, and enablers alike. It builds on diversity of ages, genders, abilities, backgrounds, and venues to connect whole communities working towards the same goal. Quality education for all, for a better future. Whatever the future will look like, we are preparing now for the endless possibilities ahead of us, with science and technology, with investment and sustainability, with creativity, inspiration, and inclusion. Space for Education 2030. This is ESA for our youth and our future. Okay. Um, the world is changing oh. at the speed of that was my uh, presentation. <clears throat> Thank you very much for, uh, for your time. Thank you again. Uh, well appreciated to the hosts uh, for having invited us. Uh, so I've presented also on behalf of uh, my line manager, Hugo Marais, uh, who is maybe listed in some of the programs, uh, but who, uh, who could not be available uh, at this moment. Uh, I don't know if the platform of the conference uh, enables any uh, questions to me, uh, but I will stay online in case any questions come in uh, via the chat or uh, via, the, via the system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Van, Mier Van Mierzel, for walking through the training program. Uh, 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 so, after we took a look at the talent nurturing program by Kari, it seems like this lecture is more insightful because we have a prior knowledge about such training programs. Next, we have our next speaker here with us in the venue, Mr. Gustav Cabrera Rodriguez from ALCE will give us a presentation on the topic, Latin America and the Caribbean towards aerospace future. Let's welcome him with a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, it's very important the participation in this meeting. Uh, it's, a, it's a really, really impression and Korea is my first occasion in this country. It's a beautiful country. Well, uh, the, today I have the presentation, A New Space Agency. It's, uh, the name in Spanish is uh, ALCE, is Agency Latin and Caribbean Sp uh, Space. Well, it's in Spanish. In English, it's LAXA, Latin American Caribbean Space. Well, it's Maurice. Oh. Okay, what is LAXA? Remember, LAXA is a letter capital in English. Uh, it's, a, it's a new organization. No, it's an old dream of Latin America. How regional activities in all activities. And in the 60s and 70s, uh, last century, uh, Chile, uh, country Chile, have the launcher, the messages is, I need organization in, polit in space political. It's the future. Well, the last century. It's uh, the last year, 2021, in Mexico, in September, uh, the f uh, signed agreement, the, the, the cooperation activities for 32 countries is all the region, not included USA and Canada. It's only Mexico to South. Well, what is LAXA? It's a regional multilateral 
Organization for Latin American and Caribbean, which will coordinate cooperation and exchange of activities on space uses. Well, the mission is the regional mechanism for cooperation, collaboration, research, development, and transfer of technology and knowledge on uses related to space. The vision is achieving equal for condition promote development is very important. Oppor development opportunities in space usage for all benefit and to the region. Well, it's peace. It's a pacifist, the object. No war. The space is not for war. It's for knowledge. Well, all 32 countries have been invited uh, members of Latin American states and Caribbean. SALAC is another multi-regional organization. Well, this is the father, well, ALSE. And, uh, and who signed the agreement? On September 21, it was held in Mexico City, the session of the president for temper for SELAC, and this, in this section, 19 countries signed the agreement for the great, the Latin American and Caribbean. Why 19 in all 32? Well, in the next step, it's explained. In March 22, have 20 countries join it, Republica Dominicana, it's incorporated. Well, it's okay, yeah. 10 countries uh, not included the agreement for the, the, the reasons uh, is uh, no is no participation, is no have condition for participation. Well, the difference between countries in Latin America is big. Well, have a countries for high industry, for high development, for high, for high education, and have another countries is very, very small education infrastructure. Well, the, the first goal is how equilibrate, how uh, increase all uh, the, all countries for more competition. Well, this, this ten have a problem. No agreement for this political space is only an exclusive military action. Well, now have a democratic uh, elections in all countries and have a problem how civil political it's it's first, when order legals is only for military. And now it's have a changes for order legals, while well, Chile, Uruguay, and Colombia, and another change national laws for more facility these activities. On October, well, uh, two months ago, the following countries have ratified. I need 11 countries for the first session, the first session, uh, the launcher, the ALSE officiality. Now, have at seven, and uh, this week, no, another, this, yes, this week, Paraguay increase at number eight. Mexico, Antigua y Barbuda, Dominica, Santa Lucia, San Vicente and Granadines, Venezuela, Nicaragua, in the next is, uh, Paraguay, and in December, maybe, uh, maybe ratify the agreement, Peru, Ecuador, Cuba, Republica Dominicana, Guatemala, Bolivia, Panama, and Costa Rica. We estimate with the 4th of 2022, we will have the 11 countries. It's a goal when in the next year, 2023, it's a first session for activities, officially activities of ALS. Well, what is the structure? No is a new organization, substitution of others organization of Latin America. No, it's only coordinate for exchange experience and uh, have a cooperation, international cooperation between countries inside 
of the space agency, Latin American, or another countries or another space for other countries. Well, this is a structure. Only six people, the president, the technical secretary, and four countries, four scientific vocal, education vocal, project vocals, and cooperation groups. No more people. It's only six. The work is cooperation, exchange, experience. At the money of budget and financial, no is, uh, no is a basic administration for this ALSE. I have a communication with a uh, financial administrative agency of nation, UNIT Nation, UNDP, PNUD in Spanish, for this is organization, its administration, the resources, financials, and economics. Well, where is the office? The agreement specifically, well, Mexico is a sede. And have construction the sede? No, it's have, and now have, today, you have uh, a sede in Querétaro. Querétaro is a state, it's uh, one hour of the capital, Mexico City. It's a half office. It's uh, only for six peoples, no more peoples. Inside, in the cluster, air, air, space, air space cluster of Querétaro. Inside, have uh, companies, Airbus, Lockheed, Safran, and Boeing, and, and other companies for activities in this cluster. In this cluster. Well, this office is excellent ubication for activities, dual education, and, and other activities for development. It's another pix for the installations and inside of University Aeronautical of Querétaro State. Well, ALSE operation. We have in the 11 countries in the first day of 2023, maybe, maybe it's a priority, is the first action is the constitutive session will be convened for the following usage will be a ground upon operated structure. Have a preoccupation for all countries. No have money, no have uh, the pandemic COVID is very, very impact, hard, hard impact in economy, Latin American, well, in all world, specifically Latin American, and no have money for more in inversions, investments, or new projects. How operation? Well, create, ah, uh, this is the priority, well, the, the operation is uh, open for yeah. Open for financial contributions from each country, minimal or maximal. No, no is the priority, uh, the rate for all countries. Uh, development of projects be each country income from own activities. Well, this is the second activity. Three, contribution for international organization, public and private institutions. Well, how the priority projects in the next two years. Two years is the program for activities uh, begin also in the 2023 and 2025. Well, first, create, create the network of networks. Have a problem. The Latin American and Caribbean have three, one, well, four language. The, the, the most is Spanish, second is uh, English, Caribbean Iceland is speaking English, and Iceland, IT, is the French, speak French, and Brazil uh, is uh, Portuguese speak. This Brazil is very important. No signet the agreement of ALSE. And non signet the agreement of CELAC. Well, the last month, a new elections for president in Brazil, Lula da Silva, it's uh, the winner, and send messages is very interesting, Brazil incorporated for CELAC and another organization. ALSE is another organization. Maybe the next year is Brazil incorporated for 
the ALSE. It's very important. Brazil and Argentina have a more industry, it's a hard industry, technology, and investigation for space. Satellital and uh, aerospace is a principal. Have another countries in Latin America, no, no, high, no high technology and no have these big projects. Well, how incorporated uh, these countries? For the more values activity, the human capital. The NASA have 20% of people and job is from Latin America and Caribbean. Wow, it's very important. Yes, how job? Well, it's the migration. The, the last two decades or two, 20 years, migration for country, for studies or for best opportunities. And for me, education, professional in USA, and now job in NASA. The human capital, Latin American human capital, have some its values. This is the goal, the first goal. Formation for technical, professional activities. This is the principal activity for the next year and the next 10 years. Education, professional education. Well, what will the intra and extra continental linkage should be like? Well, I'll say it's open. The second, uh, chapter second of the agreement, it's specific for all countries and all organizations, public and private. It's participate, uh, maybe contribution with projects or activities with ALSE. ALSE is open for receive and others, countries, activities, projects, and agencies. And now, have invited of CARI for participate. I need, I'll say, Latin American Caribbean, I need of CARI exchange experience. This is an invitation, formal invitation for the CARI. And where is the Latin American and Caribbean region going on the use of space? Well, uh, the last presentation, the NASA, is Artemis project is important, yes. Only two countries of Latin America is the signed agreement, the Artemis. Only Colombia and Mexico. Well, ALSE is uh, it's a point for change and incorporator for all projects of space. The space, yeah, no is a future, it's a present, and the space is free. This is the messages in Latin America and Caribbean of the world. Latin America and Caribbean, I'll say, prepare for the open of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rodriguez, for an insightful message. Looking forward to ALSA's further contribution to the space development. They own it all. Now we have near the last session of day one space symposium. We will be talking about Thailand's new space economy. I'd like to invite Deputy Executive Director Fis Chusri from GISTDA. On the stage. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. Thank you. Good evening, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. So today, I would like to share with you guys about the Thailand new space economy. So this is a picture that I took it from Kanes from Toulouse. At the back is the Mars car, the Mars that was already explored Mars. Okay. So. Okay. So today, the outline of my uh, speech today will be three parts. The first one will be Thailand National Space Master Plan. Second one will be the national space law in Thailand. And the third one will be uh, Korea and Thailand partnership. And the fourth one will be the just the value chain of promotion. So I would like to inform you guys that for now, 
Thailand have uh, space activities for more than 40 years, but in the past we never have a master plan for the country before. We do it year by year, and then it depends on the entity to request for the money for the financial bureau to uh, collaborate and to invest in space activity. So now today, uh, our national space committee just approved the space master plan and uh, we are about to submit to our cabinet within this month. So I hope that if this master plan passed, then we, can, we will, Thailand we have the master plan. So at least for these things, I think it will be the 15 years plan. So use at least like 4.5 billion US dollar for the, the, the plan that uh, we are going to make. This is only for the government sector, not the private sector, okay? That uh, they will consist of eight strategies. Uh, the first one will be the space, uh, space affair for national security. For this one, uh, we have learned that uh, space is important. Therefore, we will use space activities to, in many projects for the government. So in the plan, we will try to make the market for national security. So the first thing is that uh, we will request for the budget to build the satellite. And therefore, we will gather the information from many ministries within Thailand, uh, which parts of the satellite that you want, uh, what kind of the satellite that you want, and we will mix it together to make the demand. And the second strategy is about the affairs of sustainability. Uh, GISDA, uh, which is the Thailand Geoinformatics and Space Technology Development Agency, uh, we mainly responsible for two parts. The first part is the space, and the second part is about geoinformatics information, which is the satellite image. For the strategy number two, for the sustainability, uh, we are going to use the space uh, technology for, to get satellite image, and then we will merge with some big data in government sector and private sector and mix it all together to create, we call it the actionable intelligence policy, which is, which is the AI big data. You know, like Thailand, if you like to build one dam in the past, we like uh, have the conference like more than five years, maybe 10 years, something like that. So if we create the, uh, the new system, which is consists of the AI system, then we think it will help uh, a lot for that. And the third one will be the space economic development. Uh, for this, uh, we think that space economy is a new economy in the world, therefore we are going to create the ecosystem, everything within uh, Thailand for the eco ecosystem, which I will inform you later, uh, that will include the space port. And uh, for this, uh, in Thailand, uh, we have many satellites for the private sector for telecommunication satellites, but for the Earth observation satellite, which is under my responsibility. Uh, the first one we bought it like, I think about 15 to 16 years ago from, uh, at that time they call it EADS Astrium, which now they call Airbus Defense, and, uh, Airbus Defense. We bought it at like 128 million euro, like 15 years ago. And we think that we can learn something and then we can build the satellite by our own, but unfortunately we cannot do it for that project. So five years ago, we request for the same amount of money, roughly about 130 million euro, request for the TIOS project too. In this project, uh, we also acquired a satellite from Airbus again. Uh, we, they will consist of two satellites. The, they are the big one and the small one. Uh, the big one will be the uh, 0.45 meters resolution satellite, which is the first time that NATO sail outside of NATO country. And the second one will be the small one. For that small one, it will be built in, uh, it be, it, at first it will be start to build in Surrey in UK, which is the affiliate company of Airbus. And then it will uh, export from UK to Thailand. And then we will reassemble it, testing it and, uh, and testing it within Thailand. So that's the, uh, we try to create the, uh, the ecosystem within Thailand by uh, buying some product from Thai 
manufacturer, Thai company, and they combine it all together. Some company are uh, foreign company in Thailand, such as um, I think it's UK company and some other company also within Thailand. So we buy some uh, spare part from them also. And the third one will be the uh, infrastructure management. So the management, as you understand that for the space economy or space activities all around the world, government sector had to invest for the infrastructure first and then it, they move step forward for the private sector to continue. It's the same as Thailand. We are going to create an ecosystem by investing for the infrastructure uh, such as a uh, space port, uh, the satellite factory that will be invested by the government sector and then we will bring in the private sector within Thailand to uh, do the uh, space business. And the sixth one will be the research and development. As you know that uh, we start to do research and development in many, many things. Uh, such as the spare part and uh, hardware and software, which is consists of anything, including the satellite image and other things. And the sixth one will be the human development. For this, we also send our uh, employee all around the world to study all around the world. Uh, some for master degree, bachelor degree, some for PhD uh, in uh, Toulouse, and some in the US and some UK and something like that to, to increase the knowledge of the Thai researcher. And the uh, seventh one will be international cooperation. Uh, we expand our, exp uh, our cooperation, including Kali, that we uh, come here quite often to, to meet with them and then uh, find something that we can collaborate together. And the last thing is the driving mechanism uh, for the master plan. For this, we are going to create our national space law, the Thai space law, in order to boost up this strategy into uh, the main activity uh, in Thailand. Okay. So this is the legal or the law, the law part. I would like to inform you that uh, Thailand has ratified uh, some international law. The first one is the impact, uh, the law about the weapon, which is the international one. That one we already ratified a long time ago, but it's not really related to space security. The two one that we uh, the ratify, the international law, is a treaty or the principle governing uh, in exploration and the use of outer space. And another one is the rescue astronaut return uh, of astronaut and return of the object launched into outside space. So that's the two one that we already be ratified. And another three, we are in the process of ratification of that international law. However, uh, some law uh, we also apply to Thailand, such as the uh, legislation of space object. Uh, when the government launched the space object into space, Normally, we, uh, we will register it with the uh, UN USA in Vienna, and then we go directly to New York, that one. Uh, just the, which is uh, the entity that I work for, uh, we are have a plan to launch two satellites uh, next March, in March 2023. The first one will be launched in French Guiana. Uh, that one is the quite clear one with 0 0.5 meter resolution, and another one is uh, two meters, which is uh, reassemble in Thailand. For that one is two meter resolution. At first, we plan to launch it in uh, Baikonur, but unfortunately, there's some problem between Ukraine and, and Russia. Therefore, we cannot launch it from Baikonur. So we move it. Uh, many uh, entities contact us, but finally, I think we got Islo from India. Therefore, the first one will be launched from French Guiana, and another one will be launched from uh, India. Okay, so in this also, we also have the stage of drafting a space law. It, it will combine of two main components. The first one will be the promotion of space activity in Thailand, and another one is to control or, su or to supervise the space activity in Thailand. Uh, we study the space law in many countries, including Korea also. Uh, we would like to learn from many countries that uh, what 
law that you use how to manage things, uh, also the insurance for the private sector when they related to the liability, absolute liability method under the uh, international law for space for that one. So uh, we are drafting that things. Oops. Okay. And this is the thing that TISDA is doing right now. So now we are doing uh, observation and operation system. We also do the space technology development. We do the space infrastructure development, uh, application and solution development, as I informed you to know that. In the past, uh, like maybe 20 years ago or 40 years ago, we will take image from the satellite and then we just send it to the entity that to interpret it and to use it for flood, for uh, making a road, something like that. But now today we move it to application and solution, even though in your uh, cell phone uh, or handphone. But now we move it to the next step to be the AI system. So we will, be, uh, we will mix the uh, satellite image with the big data and we will set up one algorithm and mix it all together to set up uh, one system that can help people for using a satellite image. Another one is to enhance the manpower in Thailand. And uh, the last one is that I would like to inform you guys that uh, this uh, is the national focal point for uh, corpus in Duen Usa in Vienna. So this is the value chain that we are trying to promote uh, many things within Thailand. So we do it from the upstream, the satellite manufacturer, the midstream, the launch services, the downstream, the satellite services, uh, and the cloud equipment and services. And the user, which is a customer, we also do the application and solutions. So <clears throat> this is the Korea and Thailand partnership. So we are close friends to Korea, and we visit Kari many, many times. Uh, I think this one is take like a, a month ago that our, one of our ministers who is supervised for JISDA came to Korea. And for this uh, meeting, we talked to many entities within Korea, such as the National Institute of Environmental Research. Uh, for that, we are going to the building the Pan Pacific Partnership for Geospatial Air Pollution Information. And for Kali, the Korea Aerospace Research Institute. So we are talking about satellite development, moon and space exploration, uh, space safety, security, data exchange, and capacity building. So uh, that is things that I would like to clarify you more about uh, the geoinformatics method that is, that is responsible for from uh, GISDA. So for that application and solution, we do it for mapping, agriculture, water management, uh, urban, and society. And moreover, we also do it for national resources and environment and disaster also. Okay, other than that, uh, geographic things, we also have collaboration with uh, European countries such as Sweden. Sweden. Uh, this is the collaboration that we have with Sweden. Sweden has their own satellite. Uh, the space agency for Sweden, we call it uh, Swedish, Swedish Space Corporation or SSC. Uh, we have the cooperation to set up one cloud station in Thailand to receive the signal from uh, uh, Swedish satellite. Moreover, we also have the backup station for our own satellite in Kiruna in Sweden because uh, the Earth observation satellite that we own, it is the low Earth orbit things. So it moves like this. It's not a stay in the sky like geostationary orbit. Therefore, we try to connect to other satellite as much as we can. Therefore, we have to set up the backup station in the North Pole, which is the, the nearest one near the North Pole is in Sweden. Therefore, we are setting uh, one backup station with the cooperation uh, with Sweden in in Kiruna. And we also complete the cycle for the cloud segment development in Thailand also. So 
for now, as I mentioned to you earlier, that we are the space master plan. So we have to, I mean, the GISTA has a plan to build our own satellite, uh, maybe uh, seven or eight satellites in the future. This one, we will not buy it like we buy from the, I mean, Airbus or someone else, something like that. For this thing, we will uh, build it within Thailand. Therefore, we are seeking for the collaboration with the government sector and private sector from Korea to help us to develop and testing and assemble the satellite within Thailand. It might be some spare part or some a software or something that our engineer doesn't know yet or the, our engineer would like to learn because this uh, is uh, concentrated in the space, specific bandwidth uh, of the payload in the satellite, of LEO satellite. Uh, normally we do for uh, the civilian method. Sometimes we can use for, for the armed force also, but sometimes armed force also requests for specific bandwidth and specific data. Therefore, may, we might have to uh, start to have correlation more and more with uh, Korea. And this is the location of Thailand. As you can see, uh, Thailand is near, uh, close to the sea and we are really close to the e equator. Therefore, we have our plan to make the, spa the spaceport in Thailand because we would like to complete the whole ecosystem because right now we already have our own uh, satellite factory. Therefore, to complete the, the ecosystem, we have to build a spaceport within Thailand. So we are trying to, to, to connect to the government and private sector within Korea to learn and maybe we can talk about the feasibility study about building the spaceport in Thailand. And this is the factory that I informed you earlier. It, we call it the AIT, Assemble Integration and Testing Factory, uh, in my uh, campus, one of my campus in, in Thailand. So we can build the satellite by our own now. More, uh, I forgot to tell you that the standard of this factory, we can reach uh, many stand, uh, international standards. We can reach the ISO, the NETCAP, and the AS9100D uh, standard for that one. Uh, this is the satellite that I informed you earlier that uh, is the, the latest satellite that we try to uh, make it in Thailand. So we do it in this factory. So, and it's, it's going to launch uh, next March, uh, March 2023 from India. So this is, uh, when we try to do it, we encourage the Thai company and the foreign company in Thailand to send us the spare part and many things to combine it all together. This is an example of the name of the company that uh, uh, sells some uh, spare part for us and make some spare part for us. So, okay. And that would be all for me. So I think uh, the information that I give to you could help you to understand Thailand a little bit more. And I hope that uh, the government sector, especially Kali and the private sector can continue to work with uh, Thai government entity and the private entity also. So we hope a uh, good future soon. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Executive Director P2C. Um, looking forward to Korea and Thailand's further cooperation and partnership in the space development sector as well. 네, 여러분, uh, Korea Space Forum 2021. I hope you all enjoyed the first day of Korea Space Forum 2022. It's time to wrap up the first day. It seems like we have taken a big leap towards Korea's challenge to realize the space economy. I'd like to thank all of the distinguished speakers, both on and offline, who have presented us with their insight on national strategies on space economy. Tomorrow, we have another day in store for all of you. We will talk about Space Industry Conference, corporate challenges in responding to the global space economy here at the same venue. 
I'd like to ask all of you here at the venue and our online participants to show support for today for tomorrow's event as well. Thank you very much for your participation today and I will see you back here once again tomorrow. I'd like to give you some brief housekeeping remarks. We have prepared a dinner for you out at the lobby. Please enjoy the meal that we have prepared and network with one another. Also, we have prepared a small gift for you. So before you leave the venue, don't forget to take your gifts. Thank you very much.